Look, the billionaire Elon Musk has been outlining his latest venture. It's called Neuralink, and it explores ways to connect the human brain to computers. Its initial focus is on patients with severe neurological conditions. I think it's important for us to address brain-related diseases. If you survive cancer and heart disease, the odds are that you will have uh, some brain-related disorder. So it'll be like Alzheimer's or, or dementia. And if you don't, uh, friends and family will for sure. Um, and it, I think unless we have some sort of brain-machine interface uh, that can solve uh, brain ailments of all kinds, uh, we can solve that with a chip. So how long might it take to come to fruition? Well, Elon Musk didn't sound too sure himself. Getting, getting FDA approval for implantable or devices of any kind is quite, quite difficult. Um, and this will be a slow process where we will gradually increase the um, issues that we solve until ultimately we can do a full uh, brain machine interface, uh, meaning that we can in, in, uh, ultimately... Yeah, this is going to sound pretty weird, but um, achieve a sort of symbiosis with artificial intelligence. Mr. Musk believes it could also be the only way that humans can prevent themselves from being left behind by the rise of AI. This is not a mandatory thing. Um, this is a thing that you can choose to have if you want. Um, and and uh, this, this is something I think is going to be really important um, at a civilization level scale. So, um, and I, I've, I've said a lot about AI over the years, uh, but I, I think even in a benign AI scenario, we will be left behind. Um, and so, and hopefully it is a benign scenario, um, but I think with um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. Um, and we can effectively have the option of merging with AI. Well, there's quite a lot of this that needs explaining. And thankfully, we've got Andrew Hires, the Assistant Professor of Neurobiology at the University of Southern California with us. Professor, good morning. Uh, good morning. It's uh, glad, glad to be talking with you. It's a pleasure. How excited should civilization be about this, what Elon Musk is talking about? Uh, well, I'm certainly excited as a scientist uh, to see how uh, much progress has been made in the last uh, 10 years, and, um, and I'm excited to see where this technology is going to go in the next 10. I mean, I think uh, most people would be very surprised at how far this uh, sort of neural link style technology has come in research labs over the last uh, decade, but also I think they'd be surprised at how far we still have to go before we achieve uh, Elon Musk's uh, vision of AI symbiosis. What my obvious first question, perhaps obvious, but what struck me is that when patients have brain damage, it is by definition brain damage. How how could a computer improve a brain function once it's been damaged? Well, that's a great question, and uh, you know, brain function is located in various different places. So. Oftentimes, brain damage with stroke or with a spinal cord injury, uh, the damage is, is local. So you could imagine if you could just take a signal and bypass it, um, take it from one side of the spinal cord, for example, to the other side of the spinal cord, you could potentially uh, allow uh, signals to come back in so you could maybe feel objects again, and you could also send signals back out to allow uh, the control of arms, either robotic arms or actually stimulate muscles or the spinal cord past the, the injury in order to sort of reanimate um, the limbs under actual brain control. Are there any other applications for this Neuralink technology? Oh, well, I think there's uh, many different applications that could uh, come in the future, uh, but this is going to be a step-by-step -step process uh, where the very initial applications will probably be focused on uh, paralyzed uh, people, quadriplegics uh, that are uh, profoundly impacted by uh, their uh, neurologic dis neurological disorder. Um, and then going out from that, you can, as safety becomes more and more established, you could imagine uh, it moving into a range of other areas like perhaps uh, 
restoring uh, vision in the blind that whose uh, photoreceptors have degraded. You could imagine implanting this in the, the visual cortex or different areas of the visual system inside the brain in order to restore some sense of vision in those patients too. So far, you've mentioned many and quite outstanding, um, almost unbelievable medical uh, applications. But what a, what what about beyond that? There's always a fear, isn't there, that this new technology, when it out or outruns human thinking, or where we are at the moment. There's always a fear that it can lead somewhere where we perhaps don't want to go. Already the media is describing this as brain hacking. So quite apart from medical applications, can something like this get inside our heads, so to speak? Well, I mean, that's a interesting question, and certainly that's been explored in like Star Trek The Next Generation. The you know, main, the most powerful nemesis character is the Borg, right, of this collective intelligence. So... I think we are so far away from that, um, it would be very surprising if we got to that place in our lifetime. But uh, in principle, if there was continued technological advances and uh, and, and safety could be assured, um, then I think Elon's uh, proposal that we have some sort of symbiotic relationship where we can talk to AI or enhance intelligence or communicate more effectively with people could happen way down the line. But literally, I mean, we're decades and decades and decades away, I believe. Um, And it would also require implanting these things in in humans that um, were healthy. And uh, and any procedure like this is relatively dangerous. You're opening up a skull. It's a chance for infection. You're poking stuff into the brain. Um, there's certainly a large amount of risk there. Um, So uh, I would be very surprised to see healthy people volunteering to get this put into their heads. Sure, sure. Elon Musk hinted at some of the hurdles that he's going to have to cross when he said it's difficult getting these kind of things past the FDA, the American Food and Drink Administration. But I can imagine that there will be legal obstacles as well ahead, or there will certainly, or there are certainly ethical questions around something like this, you know, getting in the heads of people and trying to um, extrapolate some benefit from it. Because not least, we live in a world where some of these technological advancements are predicated by the ability to make a buck, to turn a buck out, and they're supported by private enterprises. Um, Yeah, it's going to need a good PR job, this one, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think there's sort of two PR jobs that need to happen. First, the one that the, the, there's the sort of vision of what could potentially be possible in the the best possible uh, world of this, which sort of gets scientists excited about working on a project. Uh, But then there's the really unmet medical needs of millions of people uh, in the UK, in America, and around the world that have spinal cord injuries, that have stroke, uh, where they've lost the ability to control uh, limbs in a proficient way, uh, blind. So I think the the focus uh, for now and for the foreseeable future is certainly going to be trying to uh, deploy these uh, technologies to uh, alu- reduce suffering uh, and improve the human condition of people uh, that have medical needs. Just on a and, final, I, and that's the way it should be. Just on a final point, Professor, when Elon Musk mentioned uh, symbiosis between um, or with AI, what, what does he mean by that, do you think? Um, I think he means that there is going to be decision. Here's one possible interpretation: um, as computer systems become more and more advanced, that are able to take up more and more decision making, and uh, sort of, uh, if, if you're faced with many different dis- uh, possible choices, how can you make the most optimal choice, right? And we're getting to a point in, in many different kinds of tasks, the computer can outperform a human in those tasks. So, I think for symbiosis, he's trying to maintain. He's suggesting that. We'll try to maintain the sense of self um, by having our own individual brains, but we'll be able to quickly tap into a decision-making agent uh, to help us make better choices or, uh, or maybe for more nefarious things, nudge us in uh, our own behavior in different directions that are to the benefit of whatever 
the AI superintelligence has been trained to do. Professor, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Professor Andrew Howes there of the University of Southern California, professor of neurobiology.